they update. I, I, I'll try to have all your pieces graded uh, the same day that you take them. I don't have too many things going on in the afternoon on Friday that I can usually get them done uh, in a reasonable time. Uh, one thing I encourage you to do is to look back at your quizzes and see if you missed anything, see what you missed and why. Uh, ask questions about why you missed it. Don't just accept that you missed something and move on. Try to figure out why you missed it and what you can do in the future to, to not miss it again. Yeah, right. Where does it say you can't put gaps between your bars? For a histogram, you never put gaps between your bars because the histograms, each class is represented right next to each other. When you start putting gaps between your bars, you're changing from a histogram into a bar graph. And bar graphs are for categorical data in this class for categorical data only. You do not want gaps in your histograms because that indicates, in a histogram, you'll remember, you're wanting a visual interpretation of your quantitative data. A gap in between <coughs> means that there is some class in between those two that you have listed there that has nothing in it. And so when you're looking at a histogram that has gaps in it, that's what those gaps indicate, is that there's some representative class in between the two that you have that has zero things in it. Now on your quiz, when um, for those of you that on your quiz left a gap in between your um, in between your bars, uh, I took off I just took off a half point. Um, it's again, it's just from a uh, a style perspective that histograms all of the bars put right up next to each other, and there's gaps only when there's a class with nothing in it. Okay, so all right. Other questions? Before we start with the material, no, good, sure. All right, and let's go ahead and get started. Ooh, I tried scanning them, and they just the files were right? so all of them. That's all the way up to chapter, in chapter two. All right. So last time we talked about measures of center, and uh, one of the things that we saw was that you have to be careful in identifying what measures of center you want to use. Uh, we talked, there are two main measures of center we'll work with, and those are the mean and the median. And one question that you can ask about these two is, how do you know when to use which one, right? Because remember, what we're trying to do with these measures of center is we're trying to identify what a typical response from the data that we're looking at would be. And so when identifying which of these things to use, you sort of have to look at the overall picture that your data is presenting you with. Now, there's no 100% of the time you're going to use this, and the other times you're going to use this kind of rule. But typically, uh, when we're talking about using the mean, you typically want to use the mean when you have data that's fairly symmetric. Because then you're actually really looking at sort of the typical response you would expect to get when we're dealing with the measure of center there. So typically our mean is used when we have fairly symmetric data. Our median, there are a couple of different, uh, a couple of different indicators of when you would use the median. The median you would use when you have highly skewed data. Or when you have data where there's only a couple of response values available and there are very high frequencies of those response variables. That's what's called highly discrete data. And that's like the example we had last time where we had the number of times married and we had 5,000 people that were married zero times, 2,000 people that were married once, and then like 100 married uh, two or more times. That's what highly discrete data is, when there's only a couple of different responses available, and those occur with relatively high frequency. Right? So these are the two, the two options of where you would want to probably use the median as opposed to the mean. Okay. All right. And we also looked last time at sort of the picture that we get uh, when we have a distribution and how the mean and the median behave when you have skewed data, when you have symmetric data, and such. So make sure you recall those pictures. Uh, so the highly discrete, that was like the one where we had the 0, 1, and 2. And right. Like, you know. highly, right, highly discrete when there's only a few options, um, you know, maybe something like this. <coughs> and you 
have high frequency in each category. Um, the, the median there uh, is better than the mean typically, or wait,
40,000 is measuring, again, the difference between these two. What is that describing in terms of the shape? It's describing how stretched out or how spread out that particular graph is. Okay? Again, the 10K is, again, describing how stretched out this middle picture is. Okay? So the range here is actually an example of a measure of spread. And that's what this chapter is about. It's about measuring the spread of our data. The range is one example of a measure of spread. Again, yeah, the difference between our max and our mid value. Now, the range has some limitations to it. Okay? All the range does is it just measures the difference between the biggest and the smallest number. If the biggest and the smallest number happen to change, our range changes. Okay? Does that necessarily mean that our overall spread of data is going to change by a whole bunch? Well, suppose we added one additional salary up here on the board. Suppose we added a salary of 100K to the Denmark picture. Okay? So suppose that Again, the same overall picture, but now up here at 100K, we have one extra dot. Okay. 65. One extra dot to the Denmark. In terms of the range of our data, our range has now increased to 65,000. But does this one value sort of affect the overall spread of this data here in the middle? It hasn't really changed this picture a whole lot. Okay? Now it's one extra point out here, but does this one extra point alter the initial shape of this middle piece here? Not by a whole lot. In fact, probably by not much at all. So this measure of range sort of has this drawback that if we have some extreme value, either real high or real low, it's not going to really describe necessarily the whole picture we have. It describes a part of our picture. It describes the difference between the smallest and the largest value. But there's more to this picture than just the smallest value and the largest value. There's a lot more to this picture besides those two things. So the drawback to the range is, again, it's a non-resistant non measure. Okay? It's influenced by extreme outliers. All right, well. Let's see if we can find other measures of spread that are maybe a little bit better to use. What other kind of measures of spread can we work with? Well, the range only deals with two values. I'd like to be able to use all of my values to describe the spread. Okay? Using all of my data to describe the spread is a little bit more ideal because it should give me a better picture of how the majority of my data is spread out. Okay? So, how can I use all of my data to describe the spread? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to start by looking at something called a deviation. Okay? So a deviation, in terms of statistical language, what we're talking about when we're talking about a deviation is we're talking about how far a data value is from the mean. That's what a deviation for us is going to mean. How far is that particular value away from the mean? And in terms of notation, this is the notation that you'll see written for a deviation. It's our data value. This is our data value we're interested in. This, again, the x bar always is going to represent our mean sample mean, so this is the mean of our data, okay? and our deviation is just how far away those two values are from each other. Okay? As an example, from our quiz, our average, the average for the quiz was an 8.58. Okay? What's the deviation for a score of x equals 6? What's the deviation there? 2.58. Okay. Just plug it into our formula here. This is 6 minus 8.58. Do the math. 
mat there. 